My name is Ilse Trionich, and it is a great pleasure on behalf of all of us at Mars uh, to welcome you to this Mars Global Leadership event. Uh, we are being entirely opportunistic um, because Sir Ronald Cohen is in town today to uh, meet with the National Advisory Board on the G8 uh, Task Force on Social Impact Investment. And uh, so we thought we would use this opportunity to um, uh, have him speak to a larger audience. And we have this room, um, left spillover room next door, and a whole lot of people online uh, participating in this session. And we'll uh, hopefully make it as interactive as possible because we think that might be the best way to get at your questions. Um, so Ronald Cohen, for anybody who's interested in impact investing, of course needs absolutely no introduction. Um, he started in 2010 when he chaired the UK task force, um, just as this field was emerging, and then sort of stewarded that um, task force group as a bit of a watchdog on developments in the UK for uh, the decade that followed. Um, around 2005 to 2007, he chaired a uh, group that looked at the unclaimed assets, and that became Big Society Capital, and he's the chairman of that. He started in that time of 2007 Social Finance UK, and it has a sister organization now in the US. And then uh, about a year ago, uh, Prime Minister Cameron asked him to take on this role of chairing a G8 task force that would look at um, stimulating uh, impact investing across the G8 countries and others um, that might participate. Um, so Ronald came to the world of impact investing um, from uh, the traditional finance side. He was a pioneering builder, founder of the venture capital industry in uh, the UK and Europe, um, and uh, started a fledgling firm called Apex, uh, with, he reminded us today, with the first fund of 10 million pounds. And uh, now it's very, very significant. But I think in this extraordinary um, uh, window seat, on the emergence of venture capital and its extraordinary transformation in funding high growth technology based businesses. And now over the last 15 years or so, the emergence of uh, social finance or impact investing uh, from I think a pretty, pretty unique perch. And uh, so, um, so all of that of course is to say that uh, uh, we're extremely fortunate to have him here because what's not so evident in all of that is he single-handedly um, catalyzed this movement globally. And I think I am not overstating uh, the degree of his leadership. And so uh, we're extremely fortunate to, to have this time with him, but also um, that he's taken on and made this his, his life's work. Uh, so Ronald is a graduate of Oxford University. He then went on to do an MBA um, at Harvard and uh, He's also helping both those institutions today with investment decisions on their um, assets. Uh, and we know in both cases they're quite sizable. So, uh, so he sits on- In one on, case at least. In one case at least. <laughs> um, and he was honored in 2012 by the Rockefeller Foundation for his extraordinary contribution. So, so Ronald, welcome to Mars, welcome to Toronto, you, welcome Elsa. to Canada. Um, we invite you to make some opening remarks, and uh, obviously um, you, you will bring your unique uh, flavor to that, and then I think we'll throw it open, so get your questions ready, and we'll, uh, we'll get at uh, whatever areas of this uh, very complex uh, area um, people are interested in. Thank you Welcome. very much, Ilse. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in Canada, and it's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to have participated in the National Advisory Board uh, of the task force uh, today. Uh, there is a real sense of commitment and momentum uh, in Canada, and as you will hear, I believe that Canada has the opportunity to become a leader in this field of impact investment, uh, and is certainly already contributing original ideas uh, to the task force. So, I know all of you come from different backgrounds, but what's brought you all here today and what's brought all those who are on, in the overflow uh, room and on, on the web uh, to this afternoon is a desire uh, to deal with social issues in a better way, social or environmental issues. 
Uh, the approaches that we are developing to tackle social issues are quite capable of implementation in the environmental area. But the task force is very much focused on social. And the reason uh, that the task force was set up is that in the UK since 2000, as Ilsa was uh, saying, the government has begun to look at the way uh, society deals with social issues. There was a sense in 2000 in which uh, the entrepreneurial wave that had uh, brought the tech revolution, brought the bubble subsequently, but brought the tech revolution so on and so forth, had enabled a lot of people of diverse backgrounds to become very wealthy, had increased the average standard of living, but unexpectedly, the gap between rich and poor had got bigger rather than smaller. And there was another troubling phenomenon, which was that uh, the previous three decades had talked about equality of opportunity as being the fairness factor in our society. But in fact, equality of opportunity was being exposed as an empty slogan because if you were born into the wrong family, the facts were showing that you tended to stay stuck there. And as Philip Larkin put it, man handed misery to man, basically. These problems became intergenerational. And so the government asked me to lead the task force, which would look with a more entrepreneurial eye at how we might address social issues more effectively. Now, in 2000, we really didn't know what we know today, 15, mm -hmm. 14 years later. And the only obvious things in those days, to me and to the members of the task force, was that the real power of capitalism, which was to harness capital, of course, innovation and entrepreneurship, had not been harnessed to tackle social issues. And between the private sector and the public sector, was a huge social sector. Here in Canada, it counts 160,000 not-for-profits. Not uh, in the UK, interestingly, it's a similar, it's a similar number. 800,000 people work in not-for-profits. It's got huge assets. It's got 100 billion pounds in foundations in, in the UK. I think we heard today 44 yeah. billion uh, Canadian dollars in foundations here in, in Canada. And yet the common characteristic of this huge sector, which sits between the public and the private sector, is one that's very familiar to you all. Nobody has any money. And nobody has any scale. And the reasons why have turned out to be that the philanthropy that has funded these charitable service providers has placed constraints on them. These uh, social entrepreneurs have not had access to capital in the same way as business entrepreneurs. Instead, they've gone to philanthropists like many of you in the room today, who have said to them, you know what, I'll give you money for a couple of years, and then as a sanity check, please go raise money elsewhere, and don't spend any money on your overheads. Right, you all recognize it. The result is, that whether it be in the UK, in the United States, across the G8 countries, very few charitable service providers have achieved scale. And so we said at the time, it's in the original report of 2000, we said we need financial innovation in order to do for social entrepreneurs and organizations what we've been able to do for business entrepreneurs and organizations. And we didn't know where that financial innovation would come from, but it was very clear to us that it would only come if you created something that looked like a social investment bank that brought financial and social sector expertise into the same organization. Now, as Ilse was saying, we had a couple of events along, along the way that helped us crystallize these thoughts. One of the events was that uh, the government decided to approach the British banks to tap into their unclaimed assets. Unclaimed assets are bank accounts which have been separated from their owners for 15 years or more. And the people from the social sector came to me in 2005 and said, uh, you know, shouldn't we do something about these unclaimed assets? Couldn't it fit in with our broader plan 
of trying to create financial innovation. And of course, a light bulb went on in all our minds, uh, which uh, has come on, which is that the government decided to release these assets to create a social investment bank, which was launched in the UK in 2012, which has more than 400 million pounds of unclaimed assets and 200 million pounds from our leading four banks. So a billion Canadian dollars, roughly, of, of capital. And it acts as a wholesaler of capital. I'll explain what it is that we try to, uh, to do. And a champion for developing the sector. And it's independent of government, with a government representative at the trust level, which oversees the activities mm -hmm. of, of uh, big society capital, but basically independent of, of uh, government. But along the way to that release, the government passed legislation to take the unclaimed assets away and included the possibility of creating a wholesale provider of capital for social sector um, organizations, but was less than 100% certain that it wanted to give us a significant part of these assets. And so with uh, four uh, friends who were in the financial business, uh, Stanley Fink, and now Lord Fink uh, of hedge fund fame, uh, David Blood, of, uh, then of Goldman Sachs and, and of Generation Investment Management. Uh, since then, Phil Hume, whom I'd backed as an entrepreneur in a company called Computer Center, and Lisbeth Rousing, who's a philanthropist, a friend of mine, and myself, we put up a couple of million pounds of philanthropic money, and we said to the government, we're going to prove the proposition that if you bring people who devote the same intensity of effort and intellectual uh, prowess uh, at tackling social issues uh, as we do to making money, uh, that we can make headway. And so we created social finance in 2007. And uh, the person who'd been my right hand um, uh, at uh, the Commission on Unclaimed Assets, uh, Toby Eccles, uh, became the first employee of, of social finance. I had incidentally done this in 2002 with Bridges Ventures, where Michelle Giddens, who had been my right hand at um, a social investment uh, task force, uh, became one of the mm. two co-founders of, um, of uh, Bridges Capital, which, as some of you know, manages today $600 million that are going uh, for profit, profit with purpose, into the poorest parts of uh, the UK and now expanding into the United States. So it was a model I'd already uh, practiced once before. And we went from 1 to 18 people in 2010. And then one day, uh, Toby Eccles and other members of the team came to me and said, look, we think we're, we've developed an interesting instrument which um, is going to deal with prisoners. And it turns out we lucked out in picking the issue of, uh, of prisoners because a lot of the information is on police uh, computers. And what do you think um, if we try to connect the measurement of a social outcome, an improvement in recidivism, in this case, in reoffending, to a financial return? And I looked at it with them and we began to structure what has since become a social impact bond. Now, for me, that was a light bulb moment, like the moment that I discovered venture capital, which was when General Dorio, who was a professor at Harvard Business School, came to one of my classes, well, a class that I participated in, um, and I was in my early 20s then, and said he'd invested $70,000 in a company called uh, DEC, D-E-C, a name that you no longer hear, which had developed mini computers. And the company was going public, and the $70,000 would be worth $100 million. So that was a light bulb moment for me then. <laughs> and the second light bulb moment, I mean, there have been a few other light bulb moments, but certainly another major one was this idea that you could connect the measurement of a social improvement to a financial return. And I got involved in structuring it, and we went to the Ministry of Justice and the Minister of Justice, Jack Straw, who, whom I happened to know well then, listened to the thing and uh, to the idea and said to his officials, I know nothing should ever be done for the first time. 
but we're going to look at this very seriously. And the Peter Brabant was launched in September of that year. In the space of six months, we launched the first social impact bond, which I know creates all sorts of questions in all sorts of people's minds. We were just talking about it earlier today. But I'd like to explain how, how many of you don't know how a social impact bond works. Okay, so uh, the proposition was this, that uh, we would raise five million pounds, eight million Canadian dollars, from investors who are philanthropically motivated. In fact, all of them were charitable foundations or trusts. We would work with three or four not-for-profits, not-for-profits, that had been working for decades in some cases, small organizations working for decades in helping prisoners. And to the extent that over seven years, we failed to reduce the rate of reoffending by 7.5%, relative to the rest of the country, simply put, the money would be lost. It would be a charitable donation, right? If on the other hand, we succeeded in reducing the rate from seven, by 7.5 seven to 15%, then government would pay back the five million pounds and an increasing yield that would go from two to 13%. And the punchline was government would be paying out between a third and a half of the saving in the first year from taking these young people through the law courts back into prison. And in those days, skeptical people said, you can do that with recidivism, obviously. All the information's there. No other social issue really can be measured. But today, Three and a half years later, there are 25 social impact bonds. They cover adoption, foster parentage, homelessness, different aspects of teenage unemployment, uh, broken families. There's one being put together on the early detection of type 2 diabetes, and I honored to be in the place where insulin was, uh, was discovered uh, or developed. Uh, there's another one on sleeping sickness which has been announced uh, by social finance, uh, sleeping sickness in Uganda. There's one on malaria in Mozambique. There's one on attainment levels in Rajasthan, which is being worked on. They're beginning to pop up everywhere. And the social impact bond is only one instrument for funding a not-for-profit. But it is a new and very important instrument because what it does, unlike bank debt, which we are trying, or secured debt, which we're trying to develop in the UK, I'll explain how, or unsecured debt, or quasi-equity type investments, what the social impact bond does is to give a revenue model to a not-for-profit. A not-for-profit which has been relying on the raising of donations, all of a sudden can say to itself, I can raise the resources that are required to do this in an innovative way, which helps the beneficiaries I'm trying to help much better than has been done previously. And if I'm successful at doing it, I can scale up because I can raise all of the capital that I need from the capital markets. And I can keep a share of the surplus to build up my balance sheet as a not-for-profit. So we began to develop this view that this was one of the keys to the capital markets for entrepreneurs, a very important key to the capital markets for social entrepreneurs, that perhaps you should begin to look at philanthropic funding as the layer of high-risk equity in a not-for-profit service provider. And then you've got social impact bonds, which is equity-like on the downside and has a bond cap uh, on its return on the upside. And then you can have unsecured debt, and then you can have secured debt. And all of a sudden, you begin to use the tools that capitalism has applied so successfully to the creation of businesses uh, to build social organizations. Now, in my mind, this came together with another very important phenomenon. So I had lived through the 
wave of business entrepreneurship, of tech entrepreneurship. Uh, I set up what became Apex uh, when I was 26. And it took us a very long time to get our first fund going. We started in 72, what became Apex. In 1981, we raised a 10 million pound fund. Our biggest fund uh, has been 11 billion uh, euros. So you, you can see the growth in, uh, you know, in uh, 20, 25 years uh, that, that we've been capable of doing. And I had realized that as we were funding tech entrepreneurs, we thought we were on to something that could really deliver results, as General Doria had done. And we could understand that the technology that was being applied could have ramifications. But we certainly didn't anticipate that we would have the PC and the internet and the cellular phone and then recombinant DNA and the human genome and the convergence of all of these technologies is going to continue to drive growth through this century. In those days, the mindset was that you should work for big businesses. When I graduated from Harvard Business School, the great jobs were working for the biggest companies, the IBMs, the GEs, the Rio Tinto Zincs, and so on and so forth. By the time I got into my career as a venture capitalist, the great jobs were to be entrepreneurs. It was more prestigious to be an entrepreneur, especially if you were Mark Zuckerberg or somebody like that, uh, than to work for a big company. In fact, if you took that risk, people respected you for it. And if you failed, it didn't matter. You got up and you tried again and again until you, until you succeeded. And I began to sense as I worked in this uh, impact investment space that there's a new generation, many of whom are in this room today, they can tell me if I'm wrong, that in the same way that tech appealed to the previous generation is attracted by the idea of doing things that are more meaningful for society or for the planet than just making money. And I began to realize that in the same way that venture capital was a response to the needs of tech entrepreneurs for long-term capital, and that the mindset had been among investors that you would never invest in a 10-year fund that's illiquid, that gives you the prospect of a high return, backing a dropout from university who's never had any management experience, and you're going to put money in that. In that same way, I began to feel that impact investment is the response to the need of social entrepreneurs who want to change society for the better, who want to make a difference, who now can begin to have the prospect of doing things according to their ability. Their ability is going to be measured and according to the performance that they achieve, they're going to attract capital. And according to their vision and their management skills, they're going to make a real difference on social issues. And I begin to see this now in every country. At the G8 task force level, uh, where Siobhan uh, Harty um, uh, sits with me and Ted Anderson, we hear presentations from social entrepreneurs every time we have a meeting. And a couple of words keep recurring. One word is revolution. Everybody is saying, we need a revolution. Governments don't have the money to deal with social issues. Expenditure on social issues across the G8 countries has been frozen since 2008, <coughs> despite the increased need for help from a greater number of unemployed and so on and so forth. We can anticipate an aging population with the aging poor becoming another major social issue. And we don't have anywhere to go except capital markets. And at the level of social service providers, they're saying we need a revolution. They're saying we can't go on raising money from foundations that give us drip feeders, don't enable us to, to build our organizations. If I'd, somebody had said to me, I want to build a major tech company and I'm not going to spend anything on my overheads, I'd have shown them the door at, you know, at Apex. You just, you, know, you just can't do it. 
And so the need for a revolution in the way that we attract, uh, you know, attract social entrepreneurs, fund them, help social organizations to scale up, is coming through. And the, the need for a revolution comes as much from government as it does from the social entrepreneurs that we have heard uh, evidence uh, from. The second is innovation. The second word that comes up is innovation. Now, one of the social entrepreneurs in Germany had a very funny, um, uh, very funny line. We were talking about the fact that social impact bonds focus on prevention, whereas government expenditure on services typically is remedial, right? And that it also, because it's based on, um, on, on achieving an outcome, it leaves the social entrepreneur free to innovate in the way of achieving the outcome. Whereas if you just had a procurement contract uh, with a government to supply services to prisoners, you'd have to meet them so many times a week, you'd have to write a report about each one, you get paid accordingly, zero room for innovation. So he was presenting and, um, and he was saying, well, you know, government is very conservative and said, yes, but it's innovation. And he said, yes, but innovation disturbs administration okay so there's a change there's a change of mindset undoubtedly that is necessary but i think we would all agree that there is a huge need for innovation because with the means that they have had at their disposal charitable service providers have done a heroic job a huge amount of good has been done over a very long period of time. But there's been a total absence of risk capital. Not only the quantum, but also the approach to risk has not been appropriate to their really having impact. And I think if we are able now to develop impact investment into a very clearly delineated field with a set of sophisticated players in each country, as we're, we're trying to do, and a set of investors that are prepared to support it, I think we can really do what was done in tech. And just as we could not expect in the tech revolution that it would bring about changes in, you know, paralleled in our history only through, uh, only in comparison with uh, the invention of the alphabet and of printing, uh, in the same way, I'm hopeful that with the young generation of innovative people sitting in this room and, and elsewhere, giving them the means to innovate will change very significantly uh, our effectiveness in tackling social issues. Now, when I talk in terms of the delineation of a field, most of you probably don't understand what I mean. And I would like to spend a few moments just explaining what I think impact investment is, and then giving you a sense of why I think it's going to be uh, as big as I am saying. So for me, impact investment is investment in an organization, whether it be for profit or not for profit, that has a prime objective of dealing with a social issue and continuously measures achievement of that objective. Okay? So I'm excluding from the definition of impact investment what we might all call investment with impact. I'm excluding a firm that's making a profit and in the process of making a profit is creating jobs, sometimes in poorer neighborhoods, sometimes in middle class neighborhoods, um, and by creating jobs is creating wealth and role models and then from time to time might have a project to help a disadvantaged group in the vicinity of a factory, might clean up its supply line uh, from child labor or you know, what other, you know, whatever other um, uh, social issues affect its supply line. That is great and we want to encourage it. But if you were an impact investor, you would not invest in a company that is doing investment with impact. You might, as part of your portfolio of general companies, invest in that, because why not? It's a great, thing to, a great thing to encourage. But the field we're talking about is very specifically geared to setting objectives 
and measuring their achievement, setting social objectives or environmental objectives and measuring their achievement. Now, the measurement of outcomes is not something that has gone on very much, as all of you know. Government has done a certain amount of it, some foundations have done a little bit of it, some charitable service providers have done a bit of it. But we are looking at the level of the task force in great detail at what would an impact investing accounting system look like. Who is worrying today about the cost per successful outcome? Is the foundation that is giving a grant to an organization that is trying to help uh, literacy in Africa worrying about that cost? Is the charitable service provider that is delivering the service calculating that cost? Is government calculating that cost? And the answer is generally no. The answer is the allocation of assets to dealing with social uh, issues has been done through an invisible heart rather than a visible hand of markets. We've all created an intuitive sense for ourselves of whether or not it's worth providing money to a charitable service provider. Now what we're saying is if we want the invisible heart to help those whom the invisible hand has left behind, then we really need to be able to measure outcomes properly and we need to be able to provide reliable information to the different constituencies, all those that I have mentioned, and to the constituency of investors who are interested in measuring their social return as well as their financial return. So one of the reasons I am very optimistic that this field will become huge is that we are beginning to see what an impact investment accounting system would look like. And we're beginning to understand the implications of that for investors and for uh, charitable organizations. The second aspect of it is that things don't work in capital markets unless they make sense, right? Venture capital worked because for a long period of time it delivered very attractive returns. In the early years of venture capital you could make several times the value of the fund that you invested in. Now I know in Canada the perception of venture capital has got solid uh, here and there, but in many parts of the world for 20 or 30 years venture capital delivered fantastic returns. Even today sophisticated organizations that are investing in, in asset classes invest in venture capital and, and private equity. So what then is the role of impact investment in a portfolio? Well, the role is potentially an extremely attractive one. Why? Because what everybody looks for as an investment uh, manager is the diversification of assets. And assets that don't move up and down with the stock market and don't move up and down with interest rates. Now, if you're investing in funds which are providing capital to organizations that are improving literacy in Africa, uh, early detection of diabetes across the world, uh, recidivism in different countries, it doesn't go up and down with the stock market. And if governments want to attract sufficient capital, they're going to have to allow, because they're usually the outcomes funder paying on results, they're going to have to allow investors to make a return of 7 to 10 percent. Now 7 to 10 percent uncorrelated returns, for those of you who are in the financial business, is a very attractive thing to add to a portfolio. The implications in this field are monumental. Why? There has been a mindset in charitable foundations which in the United States have uh, three quarters of a trillion uh, dollars, and we talked about the UK and, and Canada, that you keep your investment side separate from your grant side. Meaning by that, you invest your assets, you make the most money you can, it's a different team, and you pass over 
five percent a year uh, of uh, you know of the value of your assets, and you distribute those in grants. Now, what we're saying is impact investment comes from your endowment as an investment. It's additional to the grants that you're giving, to the 5% that you're giving. Could you envisage that 5% of a foundation's assets could be in impact investment instruments? Well, from an investment point of view, I certainly could. It's, it's a new notion. It hasn't gained acceptance yet, but I certainly think that there is the prospect of matching the whole of philanthropic contributions which are being given today with an additional 5% coming from the endowments of, uh, of organizations. If we are able to do that, we will hugely increase the amount of money that is flowing to not-for-profits. The third reason I think uh, this is going to be very big, is that if you look at international aid, there is dissatisfaction across the world, Canada uh, included, I'm sure, about the effectiveness of international aid. And as we begin to think deeply about what impact investment can do in the international area, we begin to realize that while a lot of capital is going today to create businesses. So if you look over the last eight years, there's been a, a, you know, a big increase in direct foreign investment into emerging countries. Uh, it's equaled only by remittances from people who are living the diaspora, living outside, sending remittances back to the country. It has a small amount of philanthropic grants at the top, and it has about $150 billion a year of aid at the bottom. Now, if you look at the challenges that are faced in economic development, you begin to realize, and this is what we've been working on at the task force, that the ability to develop the private sector in a country is constrained by social issues. Education, the literacy level, the attainment level at school, the dropout rates from school, that is something that could be addressed by development impact bonds much more effectively than, you know, than through grants. The eradication of sicknesses such as those I have mentioned. The training of people who are out of employment but could be in employment if they got a certain amount of training. And so the view that we are beginning to uh, develop at the level of the task force is that the power of impact investment is not just venture capital funds that are investing in and infrastructure funds that are investing in emerging countries, but it's tackling head on the social issues that are constraining economic development. And finally, I want to turn to profit with purpose businesses. At Big Society Capital, which I was privileged to co-found and, and uh, of which to be the, the first chairman, which is the social investment bank that I described, funded by unclaimed assets. We're putting money out to create fund managers who are focusing on different aspects of impact investment. Social impact bonds are a very small part of it. Out of 150 million pounds of commitments, perhaps 10 million pounds has gone to social impact bonds. The rest is going to um, some forms of, very little is going in other forms of equity, because it, it's quite difficult actually for a not-for-profit today to give an equity type return, unless it's entering into big government contracts of which it can make money and so on and so forth. Quite a lot is going through unsecured debt and quite a lot is going uh, through um, uh, secured debt. But what we've realized is that when we're funding these investment managers, they're often saying to us, we're interested in an issue. We're interested in education, we're interested in health, and we want to use both models. We want to use a profit with purpose model as well as a not-for-profit model because we realize that where the market forces are very strong, a for-profit model may do better than a not-for-profit model, so you get pulled along by a market that's buying your, your product. 
and where the community is necessary to delivering a social service, a not-for-profit model is much more powerful. So in the Peterborough Bond, one of the first questions the prisoners ask is who's making money out of this? And when you say, well, we're a philanthropic organization, we're here to help you, then you begin to get a different reaction. You have the same thing in the broader community. When you're trying to get help of people to help train them, give them jobs, give them psychological support and so on. The problem is that if you invest in a fund which is investing in profit with purpose, there's nothing to lock in the social mission of the business today in the legal system. And we need to lock that mission in so that the money which is seeking to achieve impact knows that on sale of the business, the business is going to maintain its social mission intact. And so the task force is focusing now across the G8 countries on what mechanisms, what types of mechanisms, obviously we can't come up for a solution uh, you know, in every case, but we can give a sense of, uh, of, of the structure uh, of the legal system in each country and the issues that, that, you know, that are raised in, in doing it. And I very much hope that in the course of this year, at least in you know, some of the countries, uh, we will begin to see forms that lock in the social mission into a profit with purpose business. Now, if you begin to add the whole world of venture capital and for-profit businesses, which begins to incorporate social objectives into business models, or to have a business model that is focused on place-based impact by establishing itself in poorer areas, if you add to that all of the not-for-profits across, uh, across the world uh, that are in need of uh, capital, if you add to that the variety of social issue that impact investment can address, then it does not seem so outlandish to think that looking ahead a decade, we could be on a track that says that impact investment is going to be bigger than uh, microfinance has been, which is today 60 billion, and somewhere perhaps on the way to the 3 trillion that is in private equity and venture capital. So I leave you with, you know, with this thought. To the extent that we are able to turn impact investment into the financing tool of ambitious social entrepreneurs, we will improve a lot of people's lives. Thank you very much. Well, Sir Ronald, that's a, a tour de force across a, a, a wide uh, swath of land. Um, we're certainly here in Canada in a funny sort of almost, uh, it feels to me, a bimodal world. On the one hand, we have this rich history of community foundations, cooperative movements, um, you know, uh, uh, engagement of the community in building, um, you know, towns, cities, um, civil society across uh, many, many decades. So this stuff is in our blood. We didn't call it social finance at the time. At the same time, we also have a, um, a very robust financial sector, but it's robust because it's quite conservative. Um, can you maybe look back on the emergence across the UK and the development of this field in the UK? Are there specific pivot points that you would say, you know, really um, lifted um, the, the discussions and the engagement of all the different actors? Because this is what's so unique and so exciting, actually, about this field is that you actually need all of these players at the table to make it work. Right. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's a very good question, Ilsa. And I think we would not be where we are in the UK if it hadn't been for government. And government of both uh, political complexions, or three political complexions, because this was started by a Labour government yeah. that was attracted to helping uh, those in, in need. It's been taken further than financially, certainly, in terms of setting up big society capital uh, than anybody could have imagined because of the rigor that goes with the measurement of, of outcomes and the creating of organizations that are run with a high level of discipline and information and, yeah. and so on and so forth. And so government needs to play an enabling role. 
you're not asking government necessarily uh, to do major things uh, to get you going. But uh, bridges got going because the government agreed to match the private investors who would put up 20 million pounds on an incentive basis for the investors. Government still did very well out of the investment. investment. That original investment of 20 million pounds has led to Bridges managing today more than 400 million you know, million pounds. But without that, it would have been extremely difficult to get going. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, uh, the unclaimed assets wouldn't have happened without government. Big society capital wouldn't have happened. The government just introduced tax incentives to level the playing field between investment in small businesses and investment in impact, uh, not for profits. So that up until now, you had the situation where you invest in a normal business, you can offset against your uh, income, so avoid the tax, on the investment that you make in a small business. But if you were funding through a loan or a social impact bond, a not-for-profit, you, you got nothing. So the government agreed that this should be a level playing field. And in the last budget, it introduced incentives that leveled that playing field. I think looking ahead, uh, the um, steps which the British government has taken so far, uh, which haven't gained perhaps uh, international visibility yet, of uh, creating outcomes funds, which departments mm -hmm. will bid for in issuing a social impact bond. Somebody has to pay some years out according to uh, the results that you achieve. Uh, very often departments don't have any money in, in their coffers, in their budgets looking ahead. Uh, so creating an outcomes fund is part of the yeah. architecture. But uh, the capacity of not-for-profits to absorb this capital and to grow also requires help. And so the government has set up capacity building uh, fund, a capacity building fund of 20 million pounds, which uh, not for profits that would like to improve uh, their organizational structure so that they are able to absorb more capital can access. But most interestingly for all of you here today, the government has posted 600 social issues and their cost to the country. You can go to the cabinet office site and you can find out that a first time offender costs the government 37,000 pounds. A re-offender costs the government from memory something like 22,000 pounds. An unemployed youth costs the government so much, so much, so much. Putting this information forward for not-for-profit service providers to analyze for investors to analyze, for social entrepreneurs to analyze, gives them the opportunity to say, you know what, I can do a better job of, of saving that than has been done so far because I think A, B, C, D. Instead of helping 700 homeless people when there are 30,000 in the UK, I think I can apply a model that will enable me to help 7,000 you know, 10 times in, you know, in so many years, in the same way as previously uh, a business would have, uh, would have thought. So government is important as an enabler. I'm not saying government needs to do it, mm -hmm. but government is a very important enabler. The second thing I would say is that in a nascent field of this kind, a big society capital which has a, you know, a powerful balance sheet and is capable of creating a cadre of investment organizations that cover all of the financing um, options for a not-for-profit that can act as a champion of the field. I encourage you all to go to the second annual report of Big Society Capital, which was published just three, four days ago, and you will get a sense of what you, of what you can do when you have the resources to focus on improving the way that uh, organizations tackle social issues. It will give you a sense of what a big society capital type organization in, uh, in Canada might be able to mm -hmm. do. Now, not every country has uh, allowed the banks, as had happened in the UK, to hold on to their unclaimed assets. And I gather that in Canada, 
uh, after a number of years, these unclaimed assets go to different levels of, of government. But there are unclaimed assets not just in banks. There are unclaimed assets in life assurance companies, in pension funds. There are unclaimed assets everywhere. Mm -hmm. And government finds it easier to allow these assets uh, to go to a social purpose uh, than it would find to allocate tax revenue to them, obviously, because it's not, it's government money in the sense that it's public money, but it obviously isn't government revenue. Yeah. So I would say that those, you know, those reflections uh, are the ones that Canada can, can build on. So, I mean, I certainly from the Canadian vantage point, the partnership you've built with government, I think, is, uh, is very powerful. Um, we certainly here at Mars and I think across Canada see this new generation of social entrepreneurs who, you know, are ambitious and uh, want to mobilize new financial instruments to, to create a bigger impact. So, um, although the feeder system is, there's a lot of work to be done, the, the, the ambition and the audacity is certainly there. Um, what about a new generation of investors? Um, I mean, you're a mainstream finance guy, and you're, you know, devoting your life to this now. Um, younger generation of philanthropists, what do you see as a shift there? And then how do we harness? Is it, is it yeah. wealth management um, in banks that need to become the champions or a new class of angel investors or... Um, how do we, and, and you know, what happened post 2008, 2009? Did, did that sort of spring loose um, new thinking in the investment community in terms of maybe the way we did this before wasn't so productive after all? Well, a uh, lot of questions in that, Ilsa. I mean, <laughs> I, I, th I mean, I think the, sh the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, yes to all those things. Uh, Yes, I think the crisis has led a lot of financial organizations and a lot of investors uh, to think that uh, some of the um, motivations uh, in the investment world uh, are misplaced and that mm -hmm. uh, we need to shift uh, to you know, a more productive direction. Uh, yes to uh, your question about philanthropists. I think younger philanthropists uh, pick up these ideas more quickly uh, than older philanthropists because I think they're consonant uh, with you know with their type of uh, their type of thinking yeah. uh, more you hands know, today on. Uh, more hands on more data based uh, and and uh, so on and so forth I think institutional investors starting with foundations can be a big flow of capital but I have met with the wealth management arms of uh, of several banks. Uh, who all think that this is what their investors and the children of their clients want to do. I mean, you do hear this as a recurring theme. Uh, this makes a lot of sense. For one thing, it's additional to traditional philanthropy, but the legacy of the original entrepreneur, because the money is revolving in, you know, in, uh, in uh, the endowment, is enhanced. You know? and. I don't know, how many of you feel that this is an idea whose time has come? Would you raise your hands? How many of you feel? <laughs> well, I mean, there you go. I mean, it's almost everyone in the room. Need I say more? <laughs> um, can you maybe talk about, you have the, the social stock exchange in the UK, and we've recently launched the SVX here in Canada. How important are those kind of market instruments, and what should, we have a number of people here who are sort of building intermediary organizations, what should they be thinking about in terms of getting there faster? So, so the reason why um, a social stock exchange is important is that there are categories of investors who can only invest in public securities, securities that can be traded. So pension funds uh, sometimes uh, you know, find it a lot easier to invest in, in uh, tradable securities. Sometimes they have a, a prohibition. Yeah. Uh, from doing so. And there is a, there is a sense in which um, a stock exchange provides a window on what is going on in a, in a sector. And so Big Society Capital actually uh, contributed to funding uh, the social stock exchange. Now, we're not at the stage yet where we have got social impact bond funds that are quoted. 
but it could well you know, come down the line. We will certainly have a profit with purpose uh, businesses uh, which become quoted and raise capital. So you can, you know, you can certainly see that uh, coming. There are also going to be bond issues by not-for-profits, which if they, you know, if the record of these not-for-profits in paying their interest uh, is good enough, will achieve sufficient size to be quoted. Yeah. So we felt that it was important to create an infrastructure for the market which allowed the market to develop in the best possible way rather than seeing certain avenues closed. So even though it's not yet a thriving market, over time it could end up being as important as NASDAQ was to venture companies because in the early days of NASDAQ uh, there was a pink sheet market. Some of you may have seen uh, The Wolf of Wall Street uh, uh, with not the best example to refer to uh, in this context. But the pink sheet market was an attempt by NASDAQ to say we're going to trade uh, in a more ethical way than we saw in the movie. Uh, we're going to trade uh, the shares of companies which are high risk, high return. And without NASDAQ, the venture capital story would have been completely different. Now, I, I can't quite make the, you know, the comparison um, uh, in as compelling a way at this early stage of development. But it seemed to us certainly that we ought to prepare a marketplace of quoted um, instruments. Mm -hmm. So Let me ask one more question and then I'm going to throw it open. So you're sitting on this G8 ship and you're, um, you're visiting all these different uh, groups across, uh, across the world that are active in the space. What is the one thing you're seeing that's making you the most excited? Well, uh, I ought to explain that it's a task force established by the G8. It's not a G8 task force in the sense that our recommendations are not going to be binding on governments. Uh, so we, don't, we see ourselves as an entrepreneurial uh, task force. I think the one thing is the, just the quality of the people who are attracted to the sector now. There are about 200 of us involved on national advisory boards and on the working groups connected with the task force. We've heard presentations at every meeting from social entrepreneurs. The best and the brightest are attracted to this area. This for me is the litmus test because if we begin to give the means to these people uh, to do the things that, uh, they're, you know, that they're motivated to do, they will achieve them. Hmm. Okay, open to the audience. It's not a shy bunch, so go ahead. Maybe just go to the microphone so that we can, or we'll bring the microphone to you because we want to make sure that people on the webcast can hear the questions. Um, I wanted to pile on to your uh, second to last question, Nilsa. My name is Jordan Gildersleeve from the Center for Impact Investing here at Mars. I uh, wanted to get your perspective on what the more prevalent barrier is to the uh, development of exchanges. Do you think it's more of a demand issue uh, with the development of, of stronger social enter enterprises or social impact bond funds? Or do you think there's, it's the reservation of investors to get participating in these type of investments? I think at this stage it's uh, just the lack of investment opportunities, really. Uh, getting to a critical mass so that you can look at a list of, uh, of quoted instruments uh, that address uh, education, health, environment, uh, recidivism, uh, homelessness, and so on and so forth, is going to take some time. And uh, all of these things are chicken and egg situations, and as I uh, said many years ago, the chicken and the egg came at the same time, if you think about it. Uh, and, uh, and so it has to come at the same time. So the supply of capital will lead to exits on exchanges maybe down the line or the raising of capital uh, down the line. The big bottleneck today, now that the supply of capital has increased, is the number of organizations that are capable of absorbing this money and the thinking uh, that goes with it the number of social entrepreneurs that come forward and say, I want to start up. 
uh, not-for-profit or a profit with purpose company to tackle a particular social issue. I think I can do a great, you know, a great job of that. So within the larger organizations that have been around for a very long time, funded by philanthropy and so on, there's often a mindset that you know, the system suits us fine. We're, you know, we're the big guys, we're raising, you know, we've achieved scale despite all of the uh, challenges. We've got effective uh, fundraising teams that are bringing in significant amounts of money. How do we bring this disruptive approach into, you know, into our organization? And I think they're beginning to work out that, well, I bring it not by changing the whole organization overnight to it, but by taking one of my teams that is very keen to address the particular social issue that uh, it's addressing uh, using these new approaches. So, but that's, you know, that's going to take, uh, that's going to take time. The, the, the flow of, uh, of entrepreneurs is increasing all the time. I mean, in the UK with big society capital and then 31 organizations that have received capital from us now, uh, you know, you get a real window on what is happening out there. Mm. But it takes a very long time. And we've been talking of tech. My first investment in my first fund at Apex was a roller that mopped up water from cricket fields, right? I mean, the lowest tech, the, the, you know, and it, it took us three or four years uh, to realize that every time a club wanted to buy motor mop, they had to have a raffle in order to be able to pay for it. And so we started <laughs> off very humbly and we ended up investing in companies, uh, some of which, um, like Dolly the Sheep, um, where we also lost all of our investment, incidentally, uh, became you know, one of the leading companies of the 20th century. So I, I, just, I just want people to understand that this cannot happen overnight. It's going to take time. And the bottleneck today is social entrepreneurs. The money, it's at least in the case of the UK, uh, is social entrepreneurs. The money is becoming available now. There are investment managers who are going on the road trying to identify the right social entrepreneurs. And then those uh, successful social entrepreneurs will become the role models for others to follow. Hi, Sir Ronald. Uh, we have a question from online. Harvard's president recently responded to calls for Harvard to divest its $32 billion endowment from fossil fuels by saying the endowment is a resource, not an instrument to impel social or political change. How might those in charge of university endowments be convinced that the endowment can be an instrument to impel social change? That excellent uh, question. Uh, I sit on the board of the Harvard Management Company. Uh, so let me say this. I think negative screens <coughs> are a very blunt instrument. I think making allocations to achieve positive social outcomes is a much more powerful instrument. And I'm delighted that President Faust has announced the 20 million pound environmental fund uh, into which the university has put in a million pounds and hopes that alumni will put in a million dollars, hopes that alumni will put in the rest. Uh, and uh, I'm encouraging her to do the same for social issues because I think that's the way forward. It's very difficult with an issue like fossil fuels to define exactly where you stop. I mean, none of us have stopped using cars despite the fact that it's very bad for the environment. Uh, it's very tough to do. And I'm not saying that different organizations can't decide that they do want to you know, rule out certain types of uh, fossil uh, fuels. But I don't think that's the way we're going to achieve real change. The way we're going to achieve real change is by backing social entrepreneurs to do what was done in tech, or backing environmental entrepreneurs to do what was done in tech. So that's, that's in my view, the, the way forward. Maybe just a related question, uh, Sir Ronald. What is the, um, how do you see the environmental and social balance in the, on, the, on the current task force? The focus is much more on social issues. Yes, um, yes of course, we've had, we've had uh, discussions about this because social and environmental are both very appropriate uh, targets uh, yeah. for these mechanisms. 
Uh, and I have had people coming from conservation organizations saying to me, do you think we can use a social impact bond uh, to reduce overfishing? Now, of course, the answer is yes, or to take waste out of, you know, out of the sea. Uh, and the answer is yes, you, you can do it. But environmental has had so much attention over the last two or three uh, decades, and social has had so little, that we felt we ought to say we are focusing on social, bracket, but environmental targets can also be achieved using the same mechanisms, close the bracket. That's mm -hmm. basically going to be our approach. Hi, uh, first off, <coughs> just wanted to thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, my name is Ellie, I'm a recent graduate of York University. Um, just wanted to sort of go back to your point on the sustainability uh, of kind of social ventures in terms of being able to internally generate uh, funds instead of going out to raise money in that sense. I'm just sort of still trying to wrap my head around that. So, um, for example, you, you know, you, you brought up the, uh, the, the, the impact bond that went to support the prisoners issue. So, you know, in that context, how was, uh, how are they successfully able to... Raise the money. Yeah. So there's a, there are now organizations uh, and actually, it's the way to get started for a country to get started in doing this. There's an organization called Social Finance, which is the one that developed the first social impact bond. It has a sister organization uh, in the United States, which uh, launched the bond that uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch raised to deal with prisoners in New York State. It has a sister organization in Israel, which is working on the diabetes bond. So in each country, there will be the equivalent of a social investment bank that can issue a social impact bond for you. And there will be advisors, on, you know, on top of these organizations, there will be advisors who can help you uh, to think through, um, sometimes they're the same people, uh, the approach needed to measure the outcome and relate it to a benchmark. So that when you go to government, and say, will you pay out on a social impact bond that measures recidivism relative to a randomized uh, uh, trial, uh, you know, government will look at it and say, yeah, OK, that, you know, that makes sense. So there's a whole group now, just as uh, happened with the venture capital industry, of advisors that, uh, that is arising in the UK. Certainly, we see them. Hello, my name is Heather Crosby. I'm an advisor to entrepreneurs, including social entrepreneurs. Um, you mentioned the importance of government and philanthropic organizations uh, in investing in social entrepreneurs. I would like to know what you think the role of the corporate sector is in this. I know, for example, Shell a number of years ago endowed a foundation to invest in social enterprise yes. uh, in the developing world. Um, I'd be very interested to know what you think of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So we have given some thought to the role of corporates. Now, corporates today are doing their best at the ESG, the environmental social governance level, uh, to improve the way they operate. Some corporates, uh, Danone would be an example, have created impact projects here and there. So Danone set up a yogurt factory with Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh to give jobs to herdsmen who had no, you know, no means of livelihood. Okay? They can also be outcomes funders. So you could imagine, in the case of a diabetes bond, uh, a corporate that is in the sports sector coming forward and saying, you know what, I'm prepared to pay out uh, on, you know, on success because it helps, my, it helps my business, it helps my image, uh, and I'm helping a, you know, a population of people to lead healthy lives and be users of sports equipment rather than uh, you know, be invalided uh, in one way or another. They can also pick a specific social issue and we've been talking a lot about recidivism, but it turns out that in, in the UK, it's one of the areas where Centrica, which is you know, one of our big companies, 
had created a program many years ago, before impact investment really got going, where it is focusing on training uh, uh, released prisoners and bringing them in to uh, the servicing of electricity lines and, you know, and so on and so forth. And I think as time goes by, corporates may well come to the conclusion that apart from cleaning up their supply lines and doing projects from time to time, they should pick a social issue and make their particular contribution to tackling it. And as we begin to measure uh, social outcomes and their value for profit with purpose businesses, where the primary impetus is, uh, is I mean, together with making money, but the prime objective is a specific social issue. It may be that in the same sort of way down the line, corporates will see their activities in tackling a specific social issue measured. So they may decide that um, uh, it's selling to the bottom of the pyramid um, uh, in a particular way, or they may decide that it is the provision of, uh, of uh, literacy uh, to potential workforces, and they will begin to measure uh, the impact of, of what they do. What I have found is that corporates are very interested in mentoring. And to the extent that you can involve a corporate in a social impact bond, the corporate may be able to help through the mentoring of the not-for-profit and, and provide volunteering um, help and so on and, and so forth. So I think even, even though uh, our focus is impact investment rather than investment with, with impact, corporates, because of their size, their management ability, their resources and so on and so forth, can play you know, a very important role indeed on, on social issues. And I suspect that over time, uh, we will see some of these outcomes being measured. Hi, Sir Ronald. We've got about four or five questions on one topic, so I'm going to attempt to mush them into one. Please forgive me, folks, for butchering your questions. So you've talked of the need to assure profit with purpose keeps its purpose. Uh, do you think the CIC achieves this in the UK, and can you elaborate on um, on takeaways that we can use in our context, our context here in Canada? Right. Um, the CIC was set up uh, with the objective of providing a not-for-profit type of organization uh, with the ability uh, to engage in for-profit activity. It is very constraining in many ways. Um, it's constraining in the remuneration of its directors. It's constraining in whether the directors can be uh, shareholders in, in the business. It's constraining in terms of how much money can be distributed out of, uh, out of uh, the CIC uh, on a yearly basis. And there are about I, 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 between 1,000 and 2,000 CICs. We call them kicks in the UK. Um, and uh, it isn't a vehicle for, a, for a, a, a business entrepreneur that wants to wed a social objective to an expanding business. The Benefit Corp in the United States comes closer to that. Now, some of you may be aware of the fact that uh, over 20 states in the United States have passed legislation which protects the management of a company from lawsuits from its shareholders because the management does not maximize profit in pursuit of a social obje or environmental objective, right? So another dozen states are looking at benefit corps. Uh, the only thing about the benefit corp model is that a two-thirds vote of shareholders can overturn the social mission. So if uh, an entrepreneur sets up a successful profit with purpose business and sells it out, uh, the purchaser may decide to do away with the mission. And so what we are considering at, uh, at the task force, um, and we have a working group on this subject, is what mechanisms can be used country by country for those entrepreneurs who want it to lock in the mission more permanently 
than a benefit corp does, a benefit corp plus, if you, if you like. That's what we're, we're addressing. And I think if we want profit with purpose uh, to grow, we have to give entrepreneurs a, cho a set of choices. Mm -hmm. uh, an entrepreneur can choose to just do a normal for-profit uh, business and, and run it in the most ethical way and do as much good for society as they can and so on and so forth. Perfectly acceptable option, it's not impact investment. An entrepreneur can decide, I'm happy to go with uh, a social mission, as long as I'm there, I'm going to make sure that it prevails, but I want to have the freedom to sell my business to whoever and maximize uh, the profit at the end of the day, and the benefit corp is just fine for me. If at the time of a sale I want to lock in a purchaser, I may change the structure of, of the business at that time, but I want to maintain that flexibility. And some social entrepreneurs may say, you know what, I want it to be very clear what my firm stands for. The people that I recruit are going to come to me because the social mission is embedded in the business. I think I can attract the best and the brightest in that way, and I think I can raise a, you know, the bar higher uh, than having that flexibility at the end of the day. And if I do a bit less well financially, which that doesn't necessarily follow, so be it. But I'm in this thing because I want to achieve a social mission and the business I build should continue to work to achieve that mission in the future. So we want to give choices. We don't want to prescribe. Entrepreneurs will decide where they want to, you know, where they want to go. Yeah, and just as a data point, we have over 100 B Corps now in Canada. Um, so a lot of interest across the country. Um, hybrid corporations in British Columbia, Nova Scotia is looking at those, Ontario is considering. Um, so I think the demand for this tool, tool set um, is certainly coming from entrepreneurs and uh, it'll be very interesting to see if you know, one particular version um, emerges or whether we will always have a bit of a blend depending on uh, the nature of the partners in, in any business. Hi, sorry. Um, in Canada, we've been seeing growing use of public-private partnerships as a procurement model for government development of infrastructure, whether it be corrections or healthcare or social housing. Um, I was just wondering if you've seen or if you foresee impact investing being incorporated into public-private partnerships. Well, some people view it as a public-private partnership already. So, you know, we can see um, with social impact bonds. Um, people who are attracted to private-public partnerships say, well, you know what, this is a variation on, on a theme. Uh, because government's giving us a contract, uh, we get paid according to the results that, that uh, we achieve. It's a sort of, you know, it's a sort of, um, of uh, partnership. I think with, with not-for-profits, um, that may end up being the, you know, the sort of leitmotif of, of the sector. What people don't um, appreciate, and uh, you know, a lot of the work we've been doing at the task force uh, level is putting a lot clearer focus on it, is governments are already contracting out considerable amount. So in the UK, out of a total budget uh, for the UK of £750 billion pounds a year, £250 billion pounds goes on social issues. Of the £250 billion pounds in services that are addressed, uh, £61 billion pounds is being contracted out. Of the £61 billion, pounds, £13 billion pounds is being contracted out to not-for-profits through contracts, procurement contracts and the balance of 48 to for-profit companies. So you wouldn't call that partnership, it's subcontracting, uh, but it's one of the ways of trying to assess how big impact investment could get. Is it reasonable to expect that 10% of what government is contracting out could be impact investment, you know, you can, you can answer the question. But if the answer is yes, then it's six billion pounds a year. Or is it reasonable to expect uh, that uh, a, a percentage of total a government expenditure should go to impact investment, in which case it's a share of, of 250 billion. So the spirit of, um, of um, 
impact investment uh, as expressed through pay for success vehicles is that you define with the government a value equation. You say to government, you can save so much if this happens. We can improve people's lives and realize that saving. You're prepared to share some of the notional saving with investors, with the not-for-profit that's delivering the services, and with the not-for-profit that's issuing the social impact bonds. Right? And in that sense, we're in partnership together, but it is a contractual relationship where the government only pays in the event of success. So it's not a total partnership, because in a, in a total partnership, both sides would, you know, would, gain and lose, um, would gain and lose together. But certainly the um, evidence in, in the UK uh, so far is that government ministers in half a dozen departments in the UK now are looking at this as a way of encouraging innovation within the departments. I know there are fears in certain circles that uh, if government begins to use these new instruments, uh, it's somehow abrogating its responsibility. Um, I don't share that view at all. Because in my view, what government is saying is, I'm contracting out 61 billion through procurement anyway, and here, I'm going to be keeping my responsibility on, in a pay-for-success uh, model, my responsibility for, you know, for delivering in exactly the same way, except I think I'm going to get much better results as a, as a result of, you know, of, uh, of, of using pay-for-success. And the fear that somehow, which was expressed to me earlier today, that somehow government is going to game this so that it doesn't pay, just doesn't hold because the investors putting the money up are just as sophisticated as government in working out whether or not a not-for-profit is going to achieve the objective. So the money is not going to be there if uh, the prospect of getting the money back with a return isn't going to be there. So I think we need to get used to the idea of social impact bonds being a driver of innovation, which enables government to set benchmarks in areas where there hasn't been a lot of innovation for a long time, <coughs> uses the result of the innovation to improve policy. And the next generation of uh, social impact bonds in that area is then addressing a different problem. Now, there's all sorts of uh, suspicion when you begin to marry social and, and financial objectives, right? Uh, somebody famously said uh, that you can't ride two horses. Uh, and I would just as famously say you can harness two horses, right? Uh, so in my view, what you are doing here is you're saying to government, to the extent that we are able to improve the delivery of services, you're going to pay for it on, on a specific financial instrument. Nothing prevents you subsequently from taking everything that we have learned and applying it. It's actually what's happened um, with the Peterborough bond which is going to be cut short now because the government has begun to reform uh, its approach to the management of prisons so that there's some responsibility at the level of prison management, uh, as I understand it, uh, for the reoffending rate. And that begins to change the control group and so the Peterborough bond is going to be stopped after two cohorts rather than three. Well, that's part of the, part of the purpose. Our purpose in doing all of this is to improve people's lives. And if government begins to approach uh, these things more effectively as a, as a result of what has been, uh, what has been learnt, then that's the purpose of it. One last question. I think we're unfortunately almost out of time, although Sir Ronald might allow us to I'm harass fine. him in person. I know he has other commitments too. Okay. So, uh, I hope this last question is useful to everyone, but I, uh, in response to one of Ilsa's questions, you highlighted the role of uh, government as uh, critical in achieving the progress that you've been able to achieve in the United Kingdom. Absent that leadership from the government, what's the next best, best thing that could happen in an emerging impact investing market? 
Well, the next best thing would be for uh, foundation leaders to make a decision that they really have to make allocations to impact investment out of their endowment in addition to, uh, you know, to their grant programs. Because the supply of capital uh, works wonders. The supply of capital creates its own demand. Uh, when uh, entrepreneurs saw the first venture capital funds, they wondered for a little while, and then when the funds began to invest and the amounts of money increased and people realized it wasn't so tough to raise it, uh, then the number of entrepreneurs multiplied. In a similar sort of way, if we begin to get investment managers properly funded with teams that are going out and looking for social entrepreneurs, that's the best way of driving this forward. Now, in uh, the venture capital and private equity industry, pension funds uh, were really the cornerstone investors of that sector. It would seem natural uh, for foundations uh, to be that in the case of impact investment. And I think it's fair to say that we've certainly seen great leadership from the Canadian foundation sector in helping to build this marketplace in Canada with foundations like the McConnell Foundation, Hamilton Community Foundation, which has uh, put a significant portion of its uh, endowment into impact investing already. So um, I, I think that's a lever that, uh, that's certainly been primed in Canada, an opportunity for us. Uh, but Sir Ronald, th let, me, let me thank you on behalf of all of us. I think uh, this was uh, an extraordinarily rich conversation and uh, we, are, uh, we are incredibly grateful for you to, to come and share your experiences so generously with the National Advisory Board and with this audience um, and for your ongoing leadership, which, uh, which is really making a huge difference. And, if I can uh, maybe end on just a personal note, as having been part of the Canadian Task Force um, on Social Finance, I have to say it was the most extraordinary journey um, of engagement across this country. And, and exactly as you describe, the quality of people who want to build this marketplace, um, you, you cannot help but be optimistic and, uh, and just have a sense that with this level of commitment in terms of putting our smarts and our money to work to, uh, to build the kind of future we want, amazing things will happen. And uh, we cannot thank you enough for being here with us today and for um, leading the charge. Thank you. Thanks thank you, everybody.